start where Balu ended. See, many people, and especially Achin and Nira, took us to be some kind of Orientalists who claim that India doesn't have what the West has, Semitic religion or the religious secular divide or whatever, and therefore India cannot have secularism and there's something wrong with India. Of course, the points we were making are not only about India. I mean, that's why it's not about having a Western origin, because the same problem is appearing in, in Western Europe and in North America today. It's not as though secularism there is functioning in any unproblematic way, and it makes perfect sense. I mean, both the conceptual problem that it depends on a particular theology, which is not shared by everyone in, in European societies or in North American societies, and the, the factual problem that it breeds a certain kind of what could be called fundamentalism or a certain kind of creating religious communities with specific doctrines and belief sets, etc. That is happening in, in the US, it's happening in Europe. So we're not saying that there's something wrong with India specific at that level at least. Um, now, another thing that came up in the questions here, and particularly in what Evan said, and which also came up in the last two days, is it's as though we're worried about concepts and they're focusing on history. They want to give a historical account of how secularism came into being in India, and we want to show, see, the concept of religion doesn't make sense, the concept of the secular doesn't make sense. Now, of course, the kind of historical descriptions that were given by Achin and Nira in the last two days used concepts, I suppose, because without concepts you cannot give any description. And the kind of criticism that we're giving of secularism as a political theory and a normative model of the state also goes for the descriptions which they used as though they're obvious historical facts. They're not. They're structured in a particular way using a particular set of concepts. So our criticism of, of the, the concepts of the political theory of secularism goes as much for the kinds of descriptions they're giving which seem to make it obvious that there's a different kind of Indian secularism. Um, now, Akhil's last question is a very difficult one, of course. Yeah. See, I mean, it's the same, it's not the same, but in a way, when, when Achin talked about modern and pre-modern, and he seemed to be suggesting that we want to go back to the pre-modern or something, and what we're saying is a certain kind of description of Indian society, Indian culture has become dominant. A certain way of thinking about it, and secularism is part of that. Now, how far has that penetrated Indian society? I don't know. I mean, I don't have a clue. It's an empirical question to that extent. But the, the question of finding an alternative to political theory like secularism, I don't think depends so much on how far modernity has penetrated or secularism has penetrated India. I think it's a question of identifying the constraints of, of the, the conceptual framework that secularism and Hindutva share today, and identifying central problems in the Indian situation of, of pluralism, cultural pluralism, that they cannot solve using that conceptual framework. And in a way, why I emphasized this problem about proselytization so much yesterday and the day before because I think that problem is one which secularism cannot solve and which has been solved in the past and even today in many parts of India. It's not as though different kinds of Hindus, Muslims and Christians are, are fighting over conversion everywhere. They're not. And they've not been doing that in the previous centuries. So there must have been some kind of solution at whatever level, practical level. Now, what we have to do, I think, is develop an alternative political theory of pluralism that looks at those resources, that experience of pluralism takes it very seriously. 
in India, different parts of Asia have also experienced problems of diversity and difference in society. And they've solved them in their own ways. And it's not a question of going back because it's still present. But now we have to formulate this as an alternative to political theories of secularism. Yeah, but perhaps, because I want to take up his question, it's very interesting. I just simply, that and, and her last question, just I wanted to take separately. Okay, but, uh, then, you see, the, in a way, it's not purely an empirical question. Um, see, I'm developing a story of what I call colonial consciousness. And I won't go into details, but I'll just unpack one thread which is relevant to your question. See, the Indian intellectuals of today in the universities are exemplifications of what I call colonial consciousness. By that I mean the following. However paradoxical it may sound, perhaps you can pursue that through emails and further correspondence because I really will not be able to explain it now. I think this is a characteristic probably of all colonized intellectuals, I don't know, but definitely of Indians is that these Indian intellectuals are not, not in, in fact it goes further, it goes to the middle class as well, are unable to access their own experience of the world. And they try to act as though the experience of someone else is their experience of the world. This is what I call colonial Let's consciousness. The thing again. They, they, they cannot access their own experience of the them. world and act as though the experience of someone else is their experience of the world. Let me give you a very stupid example, but it doesn't really quite that kind of an example. All Indian intellectuals can sit in a seminar and talk to each other and ask the question, what is your religion? Then they're putting on a particular kind of a hat. They go, out, they go outside, whether they talk in Hindi or Marathi or Telugu or Tamil, whatever. They cannot ask the same question. Unless you use the word dharam, which is very artificial. If you go and ask somebody on the street, Aapka dharam kya hai? he's going to laugh at you. He'll say, go learn Hindi first. Yeah? So, they don't realize that extraordinary disjunction. For example, this simple question which they have no problem in asking in an English-speaking seminar, which they cannot even raise in their vernaculars, which is their day-to-day -day language. They don't ask themselves the question, what does this disjunction, what is this disjunction telling me? And there's just one stupid example. I can multiply it. They, we use all kinds of words from, a, from Sanskrit in our vernaculars. Manas, Chitta, uh, Asha, or any number of them. And you think about it, nobody knows what the hell we are talking about. Now this is what I mean by not being able to access the experience. The colonial consciousness in that sense has spread very deep into the education layer.